should, for just a second, what it would have been like to sit in the meeting I was sitting in. I was sitting in a meeting, and there was someone else in charge of the meeting, and what they did was they started defining who would do what. You'll do this, you'll do this. I'm going to need you to do this, and you to do this. And at one point, they looked at me, and they gave me a task. Do you really think I've thought about anything else other than my own task? I didn't. I didn't because the way the meeting was run, the way the interaction happened, it made it feel like I was really just responsible for one task, not how it fit into the bigger whole. Have you been in meetings like that? Have you been in meetings where you're assigned a task and then you just say, okay, let's put blinders on, let's just run at that task? This isn't really an issue of virtual or not virtual. This isn't remote or not remote. This is just the way we work as people. If I, as a supervisor, assign tasks to people, guess what happens? I end up owning the task. They may do the task, but I still own it. If you want to be different, if you want to work different, and if you want your teams to perform more effectively, you need to work different. You need to approach task assignment and allocation different. Responsibility assignment different. And that's why the first step is to focus on roles and goals, not tasks. When you focus on roles and goals, you tell someone, this is the role that I need you to play. Whether it's QA analyst, or whether it's software designer, or whether it's developer, whether it's a graphic designer, you say, this is the role I need you to play. And then you say, this is the goal we're going after. This is what we have to care about. And then you let other people, those people in those roles, define for themselves, well then, if that's the case, these are the tasks we have to go after. And when you do that, when you step back and get out of the way of assigning tasks, what you'll discover is, whether you're remote or local, you'll discover that they now own the work. Because they define it. Because they believed in it, because they were thinking about the bigger picture, because you articulated the goal. And that's our first one. So, a crowd favorite with both higher experience and lower level devs, and try to bring them up along the ranks, as well as we do acquisitions and bring smaller companies in to board with a larger company. And one of the things that we found was that as long as you have developers focus on tasks, get lost in a task management system, what happens is they don't actually try to solve the problem. So as you're bringing in your teams, as you're shaping your teams, it's very important to try and get them to focus on that goal rather than look at line 47 of this file. If you assign a task, look at line 47 of this, time, of this file, they're not looking at the larger picture. So one of the things we did is we changed how we wrote tickets, even in our ticketing system. So when you're dealing with either experienced people who are so experienced that they know, look at this and then think about doing these other things. You're dealing with folks who are coming up through the WordPress and open source community and bringing them in and bringing them into your into your company. Focus on what their goal is, not what the task is of fixing a particular bug. Let's look at what's the next thing. I don't know if you have been in conversations or dialogues like the ones I've been in. I don't know if you've gotten into the religious wars, the debates, the furious fights that people have. I don't know if you've gotten to the point where you've thrown your hands up and said, I don't care. Like, whatever, just pick one and we're done. I'm not talking about operating systems, I'm not talking about computer platforms. I'm talking about the tools we use to help task management, the tools we use to do project management, the tools we use for distributed communication. And if you've been in organizations like I have, it can be a six month, eight month battle, fights, politics, People yelling and screaming and stomping out of rooms because you haven't chosen what they thought was the best platform. Because you didn't pick 
the solution, or use even the solution that they picked. You didn't use it the way they wanted it. Base camp. No base camp. Right? Microsoft Project. No Microsoft Project. I know a company that's doing their proposals in GitHub. Right? Because they can just do version control on text. There are tons of tools out there. Here's the thing you need to understand. No tool is going to work the way you want it to work. No tool is going to be perfect for you. You're going to get to the point where you look at a tool and you say, oh, if they can just do this, this, and this. And I know there's developers here who are thinking, I'll just code it up. I'll code it up via the API. I'll integrate it. I'll do whatever. Right? You, you pick up Atlassian and you're like, let's just use some of these tools and we'll tap into the API and go from there. In fact, I know some developers in here who are like, no, 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 no. Let's just build it from scratch, right? Let's just build our own tool. You know you do it, right? Because you're like, oh, I think I, think I can pull this off. And here's the problem. When we start looking for the perfect tool, when we start thinking that we can define the perfect tool, when we start thinking that we know the perfect tool, we then start investing in the perfect tool. And we invest, and it's a little bit, it's a side project for a little bit until you discover that now you're making trade-offs between client work or product work and your own internal tools. Because you're trying to figure out what's right. You're trying to figure out how to do it perfectly. You're trying to put your process embedded into every single of the tool and shortcut your way to nirvana. And here's the problem. You're making trade-offs against clients. You're making trade-offs against your product. You're making trade-offs left and right. When you look at it at the end of the day, you spend $80,000, $90,000, $100,000 on a tool internally that you could have spent 10, 15 bucks a month on. I know. Right now in your head, you're, giving, you're creating a list of all the things that I don't understand about your organization. I'll give it to you. I don't. I don't know it. Here's what I know. There is no perfect tool. There's no perfect software tool, so stop looking for it. At the end of the day, your best move is to pick one, preferably without committing, preferably without wasting any time. Just pick one, say this is what we're going to use, and then spend your time trying to figure out how to tweak some of your processes so that they work inside. We use Basecamp. My particular, my job, my company, we use Basecamp. But we don't use Basecamp like normal people use Basecamp. In fact, when you see projects on the right side, we don't actually have projects there. We name our projects status codes, right? Our, our client section is called status codes. People are like, that doesn't make any sense. It does to us. Because we've made it work the way we want it to work. And we've had to adjust some of the ways we work to work with tools. But we don't spend an ounce on internal tools related to it. And that means we can focus on building our product. There is no perfect software for virtual team management. It just doesn't exist. And it's unlikely that you're going to make the next perfect one. And it's unlikely that you're going to be able to leverage it completely without much internal cost and turn around and monetize it. It's, it's not reality. So I suggest you pick one and go from there. I'd, I'd like to give two quick examples about what Chris was talking about. Um, first of all, when he's talking about the team that was using GitHub for literally Microsoft documents. Um, that's a great example of, instead of building a tool, they looked at a technical solution or a technical shop, yet business development project managers, they don't know how to connect to Git. What are they going to do? Well, management Sam John spent a day, day and a half trying to figure out what the business process is, not the technical process, what the business process is and what they needed to accomplish. And the people who do know Git said, this is how we can use that tool. They spent one and a half days, less than 16 billable hours, to understand the business process. Once they did that, they said, okay, we're going to spend one more day and train our non-technical folks to use this tool that we're already using. They spent less than three total days, and they had a system that was working for three years without a single problem. Next. Things change, new tools come out. They invested three days to get three years worth of value. Now they've moved on to another tool. They're using that tool daily. Second example, 
when Chris was talking right now about be ready to throw away those tools quickly. I've got a couple of our developers here in the audience who literally started nodding their head and smiling, smiling because right now we're going through changing some of our development tools and we're doing it like that. We're like, this isn't working, let's move to that. Okay, this isn't working, let's move to that. An organization that needs to keep growing, an organization that needs to be doable, needs to be able to focus quickly. Don't be afraid to move on. Don't be afraid to test. Just watch the amount of time that you invest in that testing. Let's take a look at our next point. Our third point is related to fun. It's related to play. And I know that this is going to sound like an odd point. I know that you came in and thought, okay, he's going to give us tips and tools, techniques and tricks. And all of this is going to be profound and interesting. Well, I'm sorry. All right? This is not profound or interesting. This is just the truth. That in order for your team to deliver high value, in order for their teams, especially remote, to be able to work together and deliver on something that's truly remarkable, that does require people to push themselves harder than normally they would, you need trust. Not a no, it's a no-brainer. You know it, right? It's not rocket science. You've already figured it out. People who trust each other are going to end up being more effective with one another than people who don't trust each other. And trust me, if you don't trust each other, forget it. You're not getting anything. Done. What does that have to do with my third point? We tend to think that trust is earned over a long period of time. You just have to spend time with people for a long time, and then you'll trust them. Let me ask you this. How many of you have friends on Facebook that you've now known 25 years because you went to high school with them, or you know them 15 years because you went to high school with them? Do you trust them anymore? It's not the case. Trust isn't developed simply because you know someone a long time. Other people say, oh, trust is all about reliability. Trust is about doing what you said you're going to do. But I know people who would never pick me up, even though they said they'll pick me up at the airport, they'll never pick me up on time. They are not reliable. I still trust them. Trust and reliability are not the same thing. What am I getting at? You can create the context for where people develop trust. You can create that context in the guise of having fun. I know that there are all sorts of folks who will tell you, you know, you want to you wanna limit what kind of internet access people have when they're working on the job, or especially when they're working out of their home. I mean, you don't know what they're going to do. In our organization, in our group, and I manage folks from six different countries, we have a fantasy football league. We have a World Cup uh, league where we're guessing who's going to win what, and we're playing. I mean, it's, it's playtime, and it's a part of our team. Because what happens is it's the social glue. It's the fun. Now, we have a ping pong table. We have in, in some of our physical offices where people hang out. We actually have places where people can go and compete and play. They shoot little basketball hoops, and they're looking to see who has the highest score. All right? I, I know, because I was visiting the, the campus the other day, and I, I pulled up a chair, stood up next to the basketball hoop, and just dropped balls in one after another so I could set the new high score and then take off out of town to leave them all frustrated because they didn't know who had gotten this new high score. But we're having fun. And when we're having fun, we're building a relationship. And when we're building a relationship, we're building trust. And the reality is, you can accelerate the development of trust if you create the context for having fun. And that's our next point. Instead of stopping the playfulness, embrace it. Create, if you're using hip chat and people are talking back and forth, create a water cooler area where people can post animated gifs. Right? It's fun, it's cute, it's, you know, and, and I know there's someone in here who's thinking, that's just distracting, that's just going to waste my time. It's not distracting, but it's developing the relationship you need to be able to do the harder things you're going to need to do come late night or even on the weekend. So, build in playfulness. So, we've, had, we've been lucky enough to literally integrate different size WordPress teams into our company. Smaller teams, larger teams, people have worked together for six and seven years, even ten years before they join us. And you'd think they, they must trust each other, they must know each other. Then how do you get these other teams to start doing this? We actually, almost three years ago now, started using Chris Love's 
idea of having a daily pulse call. It had that daily pulse call. It became absolutely mandatory for the managers to make sure that the first five or 10 minutes, nobody's getting to business, nobody's getting to work. Christy Rossi right here in the front row spends five or 10 minutes every day making jokes on the beard or the shaving attitude of somebody in California. We have, we have Eva right here who every day makes sure that Jaffe out in Seattle knows what he did or didn't do the night before and makes sure that he's embarrassed in front of the whole team about it. That's what creates the trust. It's getting them to talk to each other. Whether you're talking between Timishuda and Bukas, or whether you're talking uh, about uh, Los Angeles and Seattle, or in between. It's about making sure those people have time to work together and time to play together, to understand each other. Because after years of now working together, my team in Bucharest and the team in the United States, um, they know each other. Not only do they go back and forth and visit each other, but they know each other on a daily basis. They know what's going on with each other's pets because we make time for that in our meetings. Let's see what Chris's next point is. We were sitting, a group of us, my team, in a hotel in Phoenix. Phoenix is in the southwest part of the United States. And we were sitting there, and we had rented a series of hotel rooms, but my room was a little bit bigger. And we had gone to the cafeteria, and we had taken one of the tables and brought it into the room so that we could put seats around it, and we could sit there and work together. And I know what you're thinking, like, Chris, you just stepped into the wrong part of the talk because we're all doing this remote and virtual thing. And there are some people who will tell you the remote and virtual is the only way to go, and it's the best way to go. And I've been managing virtual teams since 1996. So I can tell you, virtual is awesome. But here's the thing. Every now and then you want to take an entire team, you want to level up. You want to go and do a, a deep dive into some technology. You want to get closer and build more trust. And to do that, you're going to need some time in close proximity. To do that, you're going to need to spend some time together. And that's why we were in Phoenix, in a hotel room. These guys were all .NET developers, and this was the two-week period where we were going to dig into Ruby and dig into uh, NoSQL databases. And oh, the first couple of days was miserable. They hated it. But they were learning. And more importantly, they were suffering. And most importantly, they were suffering together. And because they were suffering together, they were building tighter relationships. And when one person figured out how to make things better, they all figured out how to make things better. There's a debate going on about whether or not you should be a company that has physical offices and everybody comes to the office because of all the benefit that gives you. Or the other side of it is you can find the best talent in remote locations and just bring them in virtually and build a team that way. And here's my answer. Stop debating local versus remote. Go hybrid. When you go hybrid, you get the best of both worlds. You get the best talent wherever they're located. And you create moments and opportunities where you can pull them together. And when you do that right, you get the best of both sides of that argument. So again, we're very lucky in the organization that we've built because we do have already a hybrid structure. In being able to do that, we have to make sure that there's not a disparity, a disparity between the two sides, whether you're working from home or you're working from one of the offices. So we actually invest in bringing them back and forth and having people visit different offices, even if they're working remote, but also in making sure that when they're working remote, they have an offset for some of the interactions that people are working in the office. Whether you're working with a small team who's already distributed, who's thinking about getting an office space together, or using a co-work, co-share uh, space together, or whether you're already in an office and you're saying, how are we going to hire that person that might be virtual? It's very important to make sure that you're building that structure in a way that will keep them all working together closely. So it's not either or. A lot of companies these days do either or. Let's see what Chris's final point is.
I know the designers and developers who like to talk about their effort. They like to talk about their uh, activities. They spend time telling you what they're doing every day. And they want to pat on the back more often than not because they got part of the way to the end goal. But you don't celebrate when you're getting part of the way. You celebrate when you're done. And done isn't, I've asked the others, are you done? And they're like, yeah, except I gotta do this. Or are you done? Yeah, but now I have to do this. And all I hear is a bunch of yeah, but, yeah, except, yeah, now someone else has to do something. And all you're doing is modifying. You're modifying done, which is what I don't want. I want to celebrate. I want to celebrate accomplishment, not activity. And that's why I teach my teens the phrase done, done. Done, done means that at the end of done, when I say it's done, they can say it's done, and they don't have any other words afterward except done. That's it. Done, done. And that's when we celebrate. And that will help your team develop a culture of performance. So again, while Chris was talking right here, literally my team in the front row here was giggling. The reason they're giggling is because when we start, started doing this, we did exactly the way Chris does it, which is somebody would come on who's new and they say, so you know, where are you for that? And somebody would say, done. And immediately back in back chat, you'd hear, you don't really want to say that because Chris would come in or Christy would come in and say, what about this, what about that, what about the other? Well, it's sort of done. Almost done. Now, these things actually happen. And when, when they actually happen, the rest of the team comes down on them for Chris or for Christy right now. So we have a great environment of helping everybody else come up and not focus on what have they spent the last 400 hours doing, but what is accomplished? What can you check off and move on to the next list? This is very important, especially when you're working with teams that are time is on the part. Because team A can't work until team B might finish with this. But if team A didn't finish 100% of what they needed to do, sending an update report that says, well, it's done, but six other things, they're not going to be able to do that. So getting early and ingrained in the culture of really find what your milestones are. Break them down into inch stones instead of milestones if they're too big. But say what's done, not what you're working on. I believe that was our last slide. So in being our last slide, um, I'd like to take a moment and thank you all for coming and hearing us speak. And for those of you who already have been in the WordPress press community for a little while, you might know how popular and how important Mr. Chris Lemma is to the community and how he gives back to it daily by blogging at chrislemma.com. For those of you who don't, I would like to take a moment and introduce you to Mr. Chris Lemma. Chris? Hi there. How you doing? Can you hear me? I'm good. How are you guys? Good. A little bit of a choppy connection. You've got a whole room in front of you. All right. Are you in a connection? Hi, folks. There we go. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so our office in Bucharest has a very big connection, so we can do this all day between many people. But here we're having a little bit of challenges in getting uh, in getting Chris online. Can you hear me in? Yeah, I can hear you great. Awesome. So, uh, we were wondering, does anybody have any questions about some of the things we were talking about? Anything about it? No? Yes? I have a question about newcomers. How exactly, I mean, could you describe the process of onboarding new people into the whole um, workflow that we have? The, the question is, uh, for onboarding newcomers, what's the workflow in onboarding those people into uh, the existing team? Chris? Well, I, I don't know if you can hear me great, and I don't know if it's, it's going to get choppy for you, but uh, I, I know you talked about daily calls, and for us, the pulse calls are the most important way that people get onboarded. Uh, 
in most organizations, you end up with uh, people having to spend weeks trying to catch up on all the different things that are going on. And by having a daily pulse call, you're, you immediately start getting into the flow of what's, what's working. Uh, additionally, we also have uh, certain kind of assumptions about how we work with tools and techniques, how we work with architectures and approaches. Uh, and that is that we don't really want to do, we don't, we don't want to introduce tools to a level of complexity that requires someone several weeks to get up and running. My general rule of thumb is, if the architecture or the technology or the tool takes more than two days to learn, it's probably too complicated. And so we try and get people up and running very quickly into uh, the regular workflow. And as your organization grows, there's more and more to try and onboard somebody about. So if you were to say, okay, let's document the entire process of bringing somebody on board, you're talking about a project that could go weeks or months or even a year. We have a WordPress run intranet that we have that we don't try to document everything the first time. It's a living document. So as we bring on somebody and somebody has a really good question, we add that to the document. As somebody else comes in and says, hey, we have to change this tool, we all have edit permissions on the internet to go in there and make changes as necessary. So if you instill in the culture, hey, you don't have to write a manual, but put in a couple of sentences. You found a better way to use deployment tool X or do a pull request on project Y, throw in a couple of sentences. Then maybe somebody else will come in and clean it up. So if you can get your team to focus on micro-documentation instead of large documentation, I think it's a very good thing. So I, have, I have a question. Yes. Uh, let's say you need, for some reason, to tackle a new technology. What do you prefer, to hire somebody that's, let's say, an expert in that technology, or to, to have the existing team embrace the new technology? Did you hear that, Chris? Um, do I hire someone new, or do I hire an expert? Yeah, so do you hire an expert or, or do, you, do you try to, to shift uh, some of the team to the new technology? I, I will tell you that I rarely hire experts. Um, the, the reality is by the time you realize that someone is an expert, by the time you can understand that someone is an expert, they already have uh, a premium loaded into their cost. And so what happens is you can then end up hiring a lot of event experts and end up paying up to 20% more than their value. And that's very expensive. So I don't hire experts, I train them up and develop them up. I tend to hire young staff and I have a, a value and a commitment towards training that is much more valuable. So it's not to say that experts aren't great, it's not to say that um, an expert here and there may, doesn't make sense, it, it does. But as a rule, I don't hire a lot of experts. I'll end up overpaying and, and it won't deliver. Certainly. Um, I would just say exactly what he said, so I'm going to let it lay there. Um, anybody else? Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yes. I'm just curious. Uh, okay, uh, is, was that the question? No problem, I will repeat. So I was just curious, since you're a hybrid team working on different time zones, how do you handle the daily call? Is it I don't know, productive for all the people because some of just start the, the work day, others will be probably finished? Yes, so when we were a smaller team and all we were doing was Europe and the United States, um, what we would do is we would um, switch every quarter. So currently, I think the call is at what time here? 6.30 in the afternoon here, okay, at the moment. And then basically then what we would do is say, okay, um, it's unreasonable to have always everybody stay until 6.30 because people have plans here in Romania. So we would switch it and make it earlier, and for a quarter, the people in the U.S. would have to get up two, three hours earlier in their day, and they'd switch their day. So as long as you make it fair, it works. Now we've grown past the point where we can have all the people on one call. So we've broken up the teams. We don't necessarily break up the teams by locality. 
Um, Christy here works on a, a team that does a lot of work in uh, Los Angeles for a major movie studio. So he works a lot on his own, quiet time, during your morning. And in the afternoon is when he has his meetings. So it actually works out. I, I think he'd tell you that he prefers to have quiet time so he can just focus on the development and then all the meetings and work together. Um, as now we've grown and we've distributed into different size teams and we're actually almost all the way around the world, um, those different teams might have different calls and different pods of calls. Um, Chris, do you want to add anything to that? No, no, I'm good. Uh, other than I want to say hi to Christy, who's sitting in the front row. I, I appreciate that, Christy. I like that support. <laughs> <laughs> right, anything else? Yeah, I have another one. Please. How are the, the teams uh, managed? Do you have like uh, I don't know, a leader or each team? I know the WordPress model, which functions uh, some sort of similar. Like they have a small teams of three, five people, and yes. they all have a team, which uh, can change. How's, yes. how's your experience? So at Crowd Favor, we have uh, business units. And those business units have account managers at the top level. Those account managers are literally looking after the health of the client. They're not doing project management, they're doing account management. Then below that, we have project managers. The project managers are actually responsible for the day-to-day -day, um, work of the production team or the pod and its workings. Um, they work in conjunction with operations and HR to make sure that not only everybody's getting the right vacation time and not coming to work, but also the health of what's going on. And those pods, we try to shift them between projects. So as one major project rolls off, they might wrap up projects and move them to another pod. Um, we, what we try to do is keep it so that people are continually moving around um, and getting exposure to the other people because if you keep them together, you end up having an us and they type of relationship. Um, Chris? I didn't hear the question, Chris. I'm sorry. I thought he had the mic again. Could, yeah. could, would you mind repeating the question for him? No, I, I was just curious how uh, do the, like, the small teams function? Uh, do they have a leader? Do they have a manager, a project manager? Uh, how do the roles shift between uh, projects or uh, during the time? So I covered, Chris, I covered project management. I didn't talk about the discipline leaders in back end, front end, that kind of stuff, if you want to talk about that or something else. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I'd say there's, there's a variety of, of opportunities for leadership in, in remote teams rather than having a single leader, right? Whenever you assume there's a single leader who knows everything for a team, it can be, it can be a bit challenging because they won't necessarily know everything. Um, so having uh, expertise in different realms and being able to have that kind of matrix relationship ends up being very helpful. So you, you might be on one team and still have a UI or UX expert that ends up floating across several teams or helping several teams. You might have someone who's better at database optimization that helps several teams. So there's, there's that dynamic of playing between who's on your team for a project and who do you go to across the organization for centers of excellence and, and expertise. Exactly. And another way we also do that is, for instance, um, within our business units, for instance, we have uh, our disciplines where uh, Chrissy Rosu, who we are ending up talking a lot about today, um, is our senior developer for the business unit that is in Romania. Now, the business unit that is in Romania has an office in Bucharest where we work, but we also have people who work outside of Bucharest in Romania, and we have Eva who works in Sofia under the Romanian business unit. While Eva doesn't work directly with Christy at all on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a mentor-mentee relationship because there's a center of excellence around back end development. So we try to foster people having a, a path outside your reporting structure as well. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else, Matt? Come on, we're just getting started. <laughs> Here we go. You're getting the microphone. One more. Uh, why, why 
what you're describing sounds very much like Scrum, like the Scrum major uh, method. Uh, what have you dropped from that? What uh, what are you not using from Scrum? Um, uh, the, the question, Chris, was that sounds a lot like the Scrum Agile method, and he asked what you dropped from Scrum. I'm, I'm going to step in for one second and say, me personally, in the way we run our teams internally, Chris will have a different answer, I'm sure, is we don't touch Scrum or Agile. We have a modified waterfall. And the modified part is what you're hearing that sounds a little bit like that. Because water, waterfall is what our clients use. We work, work with large companies who don't like, water, don't like Scrum a lot because, or Agile, because they need certain milestones and certain deadlines. And the elastic way that you work with Agile um, doesn't work for them contractually or technically. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say the, the most important thing for my teams to understand is that we don't follow methodology simply based on what we want to do. We follow methodology based on what our clients want us to do. And so if we're doing internal development for uh, a product in terms of R&D, it may be very, very scrum-like, because it's just for us. And we can do that and, and enjoy the process fully. But if we're working with a customer who wants to affix milestones and even payment to milestones and wants to have a very rigid and very focused upfront requirements articulation followed by deliveries and milestones, then we need to work that way. It is, I mean, obviously what we're dealing with with the enterprise, and when we work in the enterprise space, um, we have to understand and appreciate who's sitting on the other side of the table. So we end up being relatively agnostic when it comes to agile versus iterative versus waterfall. We actually have to embrace all three and be comfortable living in all three. I hope that helps. All right. Uh, how am I on time, Tim? Uh, we actually seven minutes. Um, we we late seven minutes. Oh, okay, we're over. Yeah, if if we can wrap up here, that's good. If we have a one final question, maybe. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.